I'm going to talk to you about X-ray of the lungs and X-ray of the heart. Um, this lecture is intended for medical student and uh, practicing uh, junior doctors. Um, I will try to make things very easy for you um, because I believe um, the chest X-ray is a very important investigation and as I said in the previous lecture, it's usually available to you. Whenever you get a patient in casualty uh, as an emergency case, then one of the investigation we discussed yesterday is the complete blood picture. The other one is the chest X-ray and you should be able to read the chest X-ray yourself because if you ask for a report, probably the report will be available next morning um, uh, and this delay is not in the interest of the patient. Okay, so um, 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 tissues, uh, generally speaking, look different on the X-ray. Air usually look black and tissue, uh, soft tissue, look in between, a gray, while dense tissue like bones usually look white. Okay, so this is... Uh, 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 an important thing to put in mind. Next slide, please. Yeah. Whenever you uh, uh, you read a chest X-ray, please pay attention to two important facts. Number one, number one is positioning of the chest X-ray. And what do I mean by positioning? I mean that the chest X-ray should be central because if the patient is tilted to one side, then one, one lung will look bigger than the other lung. And how, how can we tell that the, the chest X-ray is, uh, is central? By looking to the heads of the clavicle. You see the red lines here present the heads of the clavicles on the right and on the left. And the sternum in the middle, this is the yellow, the yellow line. Okay. So the heads of the, of the clavicle should be at an equal distance from the midline. So exposure on this film is good. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, I have explained this. Um, if, if the patient is, is rotated to one side, then, then this, uh, may give you um, a wrong impression. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, the, second, the second point of importance is exposure or penetration. And what do, what do we mean by this, exposure or, or, pen, uh, or penetration? It means where does the focus of the X-ray fall? And... I'll explain to this. Those of you who have some knowledge about photography, if I ask you to to zoom on this on this object, okay, then this object will look to you very clear. But the objects behind and the objects in the front will look hazy. Okay, on doing a chest X-ray, what we are, you know, the chest uh, has soft tissue in the lung and the heart, and there are bones. The bones, mainly the spinal cord, which is posterior. But what we are interested in in the chest X-ray are the soft tissue, not the bones. Okay, so if you really, this is this means that your film is an over penetrating film, and the the focus of the beam is posterior. So the exposure is wrong. In actual fact, if anything, the spinal cord and the spinal vertebrae should look very easy to you, okay? If easy, then this is a good, a good exposure. Next slide, please. This is an example of over-penetrating film. You can see that the spinal cord is very clear. The spinal cord is very clear here. Do you see my pointer? Do you see the pointer? Love. No, I don't know. No, I don't know. Oh, uh, this is a problem anyway. Um, but anyway, this is an over-penetrated film when you look to the, to the center. 
Um, let's go to the other slide, please. Um, and this is slide, this is la slide shows a, a, a normal chest X-ray as a matter of fact. Okay, I have given you the two conditions uh, to read the chest X-ray, and I'll say it again. First of all, positioning. Second, exposure. And the female, okay? So please pay attention to the breast shadow. Do you see the breast shadows here on both sides, the right, the right and the left? I'm sorry that the point you don't see the pointer. Uh, otherwise, you would have seen the clear, particularly the lower border of the breast, okay? Sometimes this is confused. That's why on reading a chest X-ray, uh, um, you should know whether the patient is a male or a female. Okay, and please don't confuse the breast shadow for an abnormality. Next slide, please. Yes, um, this is an example of underpenetrated film, and uh, you you know the 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 example I have. Uh, shown before is an overexposed film. This is under um, uh, the contrary, under uh, uh, exposed film, and you can see that the heart look look different. The lung. Uh, so the lung feel, uh, clear, clear, clear. Okay, okay. Go to next. Go to next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, um, this is uh, an abnormal chest X-ray, okay? And uh, um, I have given you some history about this patient. Actually, this is a woman, and she's 72 years old. She complained of shortness of breath and dry cough non-productive cough. Her FEV1 force expiratory volume in one second over vital capacity is normal. What does this mean? This means that the respiratory defect here is a restrictive and not obstructive. Is this a clear? What you see here in the lung fields on both sides, actually, you see this shadowing. And how do I describe this shadowing? I, I will describe it as infiltrative all over the place. And it is fibronodular. Fibronodular. Please, please remember this. Okay. So fibronodular shadowing in both lung fields in a 72-year-old woman complaining of shortness of her breath and the respiratory function test is suggestive of restrictive lung disease this is fibrosing alveolitis. This is fibrosing alveolitis. This patient clinically will be cyanosed and she may have a clubbing of the fingers. When you, when you examine the chest, when you examine the chest, particularly on auscultation, you will hear coarse crepitations over the back of the chest in a patient like this. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a 56-year-old woman complaining of a dry cough, shortness of uh, breath for uh, for seven months, and her pulmonary function test showing a restrictive uh, pattern. Again, this is fibrosing alveolitis, and you can see the chest X-ray here. The heart is a spindle, and the 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 uh, the chest look hyperinflated. Next slide, please. <coughs> okay, this is a 40 years old patient presented with cough, fever, and myalgia. Cough, fever, and myalgia. And you can see here that there are some wires in. So this patient is in the ICU. Actually, this patient is under monitoring in the ICU, and this indicates that the patient is seriously sick. Okay. Um, Fever, cough, and myalgia 
and seriously ill young young patient okay if you look here if you look here i'm sorry that the pointer is not there but on the left hand side of the film there is an infiltrative shadow about the middle of the uh, of the field on the left hand side and uh, this is pneumonia this is pneumonia. Uh, this is very this is typical, typical this is of very mycoplasma typical of my pneumonia okay um, because of the uh, the myalgia which is which is very suggestive okay um, go to next slide please go to the slide please yes um yes um Is this, is this next yeah stay here please stay here yeah okay. stay here please stay yeah. here okay yeah. okay um before discussing this slide i want to remind you about the gross anatomy of the lung the gross anatomy of the lung the right lung has three lobes in it anterior uh, uh, superior lobe uh, and the superior happened to be anterior as well happened to be and then there is inferior and the inferior is posterior as well and a middle lobe the middle lobe covers the border of the heart this is this is important to remember this bit of anatomy is important to remember on reading a chest x-ray okay on the left side we have only two uh, two lobes upper, which is upper and anterior lower and the lower is posterior as on the right side and there is lingula okay here in this film you can see that there is a shadow an infiltrative shadow on the on the middle middle zone of of the heart okay and you can see that there is they say, uh, this this shadow is infiltrative what do i mean by infiltrative it means that it fades away in the lung and here here this is an important point uh, lesions in the lungs are two types either infiltrative like this one infiltrative like this one and this indicates that it's either inflammatory like pneumonia or primary malignancy like bronchogenic carcinoma of the lung if the lesion is well demarcated and i will show you some well demarcated lesions if the lesion is well demarcated then this is either secondary means malignancy coming from elsewhere metastasizing to the lung because if they metastasize to the lung usually they don't invade okay this is uh, number one number two possibility number two is that it could be a benign tumor like adenoma benign adenoma of the lung because a benign adenoma does not infiltrate the lesion here the lesion here you can see on the left hand side is infiltrative and this is this is this is pneumonia this is pneumonia when the pneumonia this pneumonia affects the middle lobe when the middle lobe is affected then you want to be able to tell the the lesion from the border of the heart because as i said earlier the middle lobe overlaps the heart and this is called the silhouette sign silhouette sign remember this please and you may ask what's the meaning of silhouette silhouette is, is a french word and um, i don't know how how to tell but uh, suppose that you see one of your friends from from behind the glass and the glass is non opaque and you say this is my friend ali for example but you haven't seen his the detail of his face then what you have seen out of him is his silhouette okay that's why for the same reason on on describing the chest x ray we say the heart silhouette why why we say the heart silhouette because the heart is in motion always movement 
okay? So the border of the heart will look hazy always because the heart is, is in systole and diastole, okay? If you see the heart border are very clear, clear cut, then this means that the patient is dead. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah, this is consolidation. Yeah, next slide, please. Okay, this is, um, um, you can see here, we have the arrows and the arrows are pointing to a lesion. Very good, yeah, I can see your pointer. The arrows are pointing to a lesion um, in the left lung. And this lesion, you can see the lesion is dense in the center and it fades away. Yes, very good. And it fades away towards the periphery. So how do you des describe this lesion? Do you describe it as infiltrative or well demarcated? I will describe it as infiltrative. So this is pneumonia. This is pneumonia. Next slide, please. <coughs> okay. This is this is an important slide as well. You can see on the on the right hand side of this slide, which is the left lung. Again, you can see an infiltrative lesion. You see the upper part of the lesion, yes. Yes, the upper part of the lesion is infiltrative, while lower down at the costophrenic angle, at the left costophrenic angle in here, the shadow is dense, okay? And the shadow is dense. So what is this? This is a pneumonia, but not only pneumonia. This is a pneumonia with a pleural effusion, with left-sided pleural effusion. And is it usual for patients with pneumonia to develop the answer is yes. One of the complications of pneumonia is a pleural effusion. And to be honest, here on the chest X-ray, it's difficult to tell where is the consolidation because pneumonia is, uh, causes consolidation and where is the pleural effusion. Uh, clinically, uh, clinically, you can differentiate. And what do I mean by uh, uh, clinically? By examining the chest. And if you remember in the first lecture, we said examination, uh, examination of the chest is inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. On an inspection, when you stand at the feet of the bed and ask, the patient, ask your patient to take a deep breath in and out, you will see in this patient that the right lung is moving normally while, while the left lung is very much restricted. Uh, probably only part of the, the upper lung, which is normal, will move a little bit with respiration, but the lower part will not move. And this is a, princ a principle on inspection. Always when you inspect, the side which moves well with respiration is the normal, and the side which does not move with respiration is the abnormal, okay? So th uh, uh, this is inspection. Second is palpation. You will see by palpation that the uh, chest movement on the left side is restricted. And then the second uh, uh, examination in the palpation is the transmitted sound, the, vo the vocal frimitus. You place, you place your, your finger, uh, your, uh, the border of your palm, the border of your palm, on the normal side, always start from the normal side and ask the patient to say 44 and you will get the vibration, normal vibration. Then go to the left side, say 44, the same, okay, in the upper lung and then go lower down on the right lung, 44, normal. And then you go over the consolidated area, consolidated area here. Move your arrow, please, Muhammad, up. In here, yes, consolidate, yes, yes, over the consolidated area, and what you will, what you will feel, you will feel that the transmitted sound is exaggerated, is exaggerated. Why? Very good. Yes, this is the area. Why over this area the sound is exaggerated? Because the lung underneath is consolidated, and a consolidated lung has a fluid in it and has cells. 
fluid and cells, while the other lung is normal. A normal lung, more than 85% of its mass is air, and the air is a bad transmitter for sounds. A fluid and solid is a better transmitter for, for sound. For this reason, for this reason, when you place your finger here over the arrow, you will, you will feel the, tra the transmitted sound, the 44, much better than when you, when you place your, your hand on the normal side, on the right lung. Is this clear? Then you go down. Yes, yes, this is the right side. Here it's diminished. Then you go in the abnormality on the left side, lower down. Go lower. Yes, yes, in here, in here. Yeah, stop here. Yeah, in here on the lower side. This is the heart. Just go a little lateral, a little lateral. Okay, from the front, but this is easier on examination from the back. And you will place your hand there. Ask the patient to say 44. You will, you will feel that there is nothing. The transmitted sounds are absent when the patient say 44. And here you may ask uh, uh, the question, why is it absent? Because you, we said earlier sounds are transmitted better by a fluid. And this is a fluid, yes. But the fluid here is not in the, in the lung itself. It's in the pleural space between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura and the lung and the bronchi will be shifted a little to the other side. And as a matter of fact, if you see the trachea here, if you go up and see the trachea, the trachea is a little bit shifted to the, to the right, which, which indicates that there is a sizable pleural effusion. The trachea is higher up. Okay, so we, we have finished now the uh, uh, on examination palpation of the chest what is after palpation what's the thing after palpation is percussion okay we percuss over the normal side over the normal lung and the percussion is resonant in here yes in here is resonant we go to the other side, we go to the other side, the upper part, which is normal, again, percussion note is resonant. Then we go over the consolidation, we go over the consolidation, and the, the percussion is dull. Over the consolidation, dull. Why? Because there is a fluid, uh, uh, there is a fluid and there is some air. You go lower down, you go lower down over the pleural effusion and it is a stony dull. So stony dull lower down, just dull above it. And you may say here that it is, it's, it's difficult to tell dull from a stony dull. No, it's not difficult. With experience, you will, you will be able to say that this is dull and this is a stony dull. Okay. Now we go, we go for auscultation. Okay, auscultation over the normal lung, you will hear vesicular breathing. And when you go to the other side over the consolidated area, yes, in here, just go a little higher. Yes, in here, you will hear a bronchial breathing. And what do we mean by bronchial breathing? Bronchial breathing is just like putting your stethoscope over the trachea. So the sound will be directly uh, goes from the from the bronchi to your uh, to your stethoscope, okay. While on the other side, it's vesicular. Why? Because there is lung tissue in between, and the lung tissue, as I said earlier, has air in it. Most of it is air, and air is a bad transmitter for sound. That's why it's vesicular in here, bronchial breathing in here. When you hear bronchial breathing, you should do what we call whispering pectoral aqua, to confirm that what you heard was a bronchial breathing. And how do we do whispering pectoral aqua? Teach the patient to whisper 44 or 44. Okay? This is a whisper. This is not a whisper. Is this clear? Whisper in Arabic means ham, hamse, hamse, okay? When you place your stethoscope 
over the normal lung and the patient whispers 44, you will hear nothing. You won't be able to tell, yes, over this area, very good. You won't be able to tell that the patient said 44. But when you go over the consolidated area, and here, yes, exactly, over the consolidated area, and the patient whispers 44, it will come direct to your ear clearly 44. As I said, because the lung contains some fluid, or some fluid in it, and the cells, uh, uh, some solid as well. This is just like putting your ear on a solid uh, uh, object on, on the railway station. You will hear the rail coming from, from a distance, okay? But by air, you won't be able to hear. When you go lower down, when you go lower down over the pleural effusion, breath, breath sounds are absent. Why absent? Because the lung and the bronchi are pushed away, and what is there? Just a fluid in the plural, in the plural space. Next slide, please. Um, this is a fifty-year-old man complaining of low-grade fever, cough, and the cough is blood-stained sometimes. Okay, uh, he he didn't say here in the slide that that there is sputum. Okay, but there is some blood in it, and uh, uh, and the blood is not always sometime. And the history dates back to five months. What you see here, what you see here on the left lung in the middle zone of the left lung, yes, you see a cavity. Do you see the lower part of the cavity is very dense? The upper part is is, is less dense. Okay, uh, plus you see. You see in the hyla, in the left hilum, go to the left hilum, yes, yes. This is a collection of lymph nodes, and there, there are lymphadenopathy on the right hilum as well. On the Exactly. This is typical tuberculosis. This is typical tuberculosis. Okay, next slide, please. Um uh, this patient was seen in casualty complaining of abdominal pain. Okay? Um, uh, a plain x-ray of the abdomen or of the chest was, was done, and you can see here the arrows point to air under diaphragm. Air under the right diaphragm, in here exactly, and air under the left diaphragm. This is a perforated viscous. This is a perforated viscous. In this patient, it was perforated duodenal ulcer. Next slide, please. <coughs> um, this patient complains of painful nodules on both legs, a dry cuff, and increasing shortness of breath for six months. Okay, you can see bilateral lymphadenopathy bilateral lymphadenopathy. With this history, this is very suggestive of, um, uh, of sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis, okay? Um, the, the lesion on the leg is erythema nodosum. Erythema nodosum are um, uh, probably one day, I'll show you some slides. They are nodules and they are painful. Uh, they occur with uh, with tuberculosis sometimes, with streptococcal infection, as a side effect of some drugs with uh, uh, with systemic lupus erythematosus, and they occur typically with sarcoidosis. Next slide, please. Uh, here is a thirty-year-old man presented to the emergency department after falling from one one and a half meter in high and landing on the right chest, okay, uh, on a concrete block, okay, so one and a half meter exactly on the, uh, directly on the chest and a concrete uh, a block, uh, this definitely will cause some, some injury. His vital signs, the hemoglobin, uh, uh, sorry, the heart rate is 85 per minute, which is not bad. The breath sounds 20 per minute, again, with the normal oxygen saturation, 96. Again, um, uh, not bad. 
and then we have a, a chest x-ray next slide the blood pressure is 130 over 80 go to next slide which is this chest x-ray yes here is the chest x-ray and you can see here on the right side on the right side lower down there is a fractured rib go more yes yes exactly very good muhammad this is the fractured rib so what what the fractured rib has done it lacerated the lung okay and causing what we call hemothorax the right costophrenic angle right costophrenic angle is obliterated is obliterated okay the treatment in here is conservative the rib doesn't need anything it will and the vital signs as you have seen of the patient are not bad so just give him some painkillers keep him in bed okay less movement and you will see that this patient will move his left lung more than the right and this occurs when there is when there is uh, pain on one side uh, normally we cannot move one side of the of the chest only normally but when you have a problem if you have pain on one side then yes movement will be restricted by pain go to next slide please yes um, this patient presented with left sided chest pain and shortness of a breath and shortness of a breath here here what you see the the pathology is on the left side okay yes and you can see that the mediastinum is shifted to the right do you see the yes this is the trachea the trachea is shifted to the right go to the left again in between the ribs in between the ribs there there is no lung marking complete absence of the lung marking and this is a very important sign of pneumothorax the other important sign to diagnose pneumothorax is to see the border of the lung and the border of the lung is very near to the heart border go down go down please yes this is the heart border and the outermost is the, yeah, the outermost is the lung border this is this is the heart border but the outermost yeah put your yes put your pointer on the outermost go down a little go down a little the outer more the outermost is the lung okay so remember please to diagnose pneumothorax you need two signs on the chest x-ray first of all complete absence why complete absence because just attenuation may indicate a big emphysematous bullus but complete absence and seeing the lung border indicate pneumothorax on examination you will see that the right chest on on inspection you will see that the left chest is bulging outside the left chest is bulging because there is air in it particularly the upper part because air goes up, up there and on asking the patient to take a breath, a breath, uh, to breathe in and out you will see that the right chest is moving better than the left chest on palpation you will see that the trachea you know how to to feel for the trachea just like this the trachea is shifted to the other side okay and you will see that uh, the transmitted sounds are completely absent on the left side say 44 44 completely absent because the lung and the bronchial tree is shifted to the other side the percussion note the percussion note is vesicular on the right side and uh, 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 sorry resonant on the right side and hyper resonant tympanic hyper resonant on the left side yes in here in the affected area auscultation in auscultation you will hear vesicular breathing on the right side and complete absence of, of a, a breath sounds on the left the treatment here is either direct as, uh, aspiration of the air by by using a three way valve and a needle or by inserting a chest tube next slide please <coughs> next 
Next slide, please. Yes. Okay. Again, there is, uh, there is some history regarding this patient. There is cough, sputum, and fever for one week. If you look to the, to the right lung of the patient, which is on your left-hand side, yes, there is a lesion here. And is this lesion well demarcated or infiltrative? It's infiltrative. Can we see, can we tell the lesion apart from the diaphragm? Yes, the diaphragm lower down, very, very good. Where the arrow is here, the diaphragm is very clear. So this, this lesion is not in the lower lobe. Should the lesion be in the lower lobe, you wouldn't have seen the, di the diaphragm from the lesion. And this is what we call the silhouette sign. But if you see the cardiac border, if you go to the cardiac border, yes, exactly here. Can you see the can you tell the cardiac border from the lesion itself? The answer is no. They intermingle. So this is this lesion is in the middle lobe, and this is called the silhouette sign. Okay, so this is a pneumonia of right middle lobe. Okay, if you get a chest X-ray like this, then the full your full answer should be infiltrative lesion on the right side. And what is the diagnosis? Most probably this is inflammatory process or pneumonia of the right middle lobe. Why the right middle lobe? Because it overlaps the heart and the diaphragm is clear. So the silhouette sign indicates that it's the middle lobe. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, this is an important slide as well. This patient complained of shortness of breath for three years. Actually, I have seen this patient in Prince Hamza Hospital, Amman. And believe it or not, this patient was admitted four times before I saw him. Each time admitted with shortness of breath, they give him diuretics and they send him home. While you can see here in the, you can see quite clearly here, over the heart shadow, there is fluid level. Yes, yes. This is the point. This is fluid level. So this is hiatus hernia. The stomach has moved up in the chest. You know the stomach, all the stomach should be in the, in the abdomen. But here where Muhammad is pointing to you, this is a fluid level over the heart shadow. And this indicates hiatus hernia. The treatment is surgery, pulling the, the, the stomach down and the stitching the stomach and fixing the diaphragm. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, um, uh, this is a lady with the history of carcinoma of the uterus. She presented with shortness of breath. Here you can see on both sides multiple lesions. Uh, yes, yes, this is on the right and on the left. Mul yes, all these, all these. These are metastases. They are non-infiltrative. They look, they look rather well demarcated. So they are secondaries in the lung. Yes. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, um, uh, this patient, this chest X-ray, is difficult to read. But look to the yellow arrow. Do you see the yellow arrow? Yes. The yellow arrow. Um, um, telling you that the trachea is shifted to the right, okay? While the black arrows down there, the black arrows, is pointing to a well-demarcated lesion, well-demarcated lesion causing collapse, collapse of the right lower lobe. So this is a foreign body. A foreign body went into the trachea causing sudden collapse of the right lower low. And why the patient, although the lung field on the other side look normal, why the patient to present so suddenly and he's so ill in the 
and the and the and the ICU because because it's sudden. Okay, if you if you obliterate if you obliterate the the bronchus gradually on one side, probably the patient won't feel it. But when it it occurs suddenly, just like this, then this uh, uh, by a foreign body, then uh, 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 the patient will present in an acute form. In old people, in old people, an inhaled tooth can cause this problem, and the same in in children. The treatment is a bronchos a bronchoscopy and pulling the uh, the foreign body out. Next slide, please. Okay, um, this is another infiltrative lesion, but uh, the silhouette sign, does the silhouette sign, yes, exactly, tell us that it is the lower lobe or the middle lobe? It's the lower lobe. Why? Because you can't see the, the diaphragm, yes, it intermingles with the diaphragm, but you can't tell it apart from the heart border. The heart border, yes, yes, is clear from... Okay, so this is uh, pneumonia of the right lower lobe. Your full answer shouldn't be just pneumonia, pneumonia of the right lower lobe. Next slide, please. This is a difficult slide, but very important. This patient presented with uh, sudden shortness of a breath. And in between these two arrows, in between these two arrows, you can see that lung markings are very much attenuated. Lung markings are decreased. Yes, yes, where Muhammad is pointing. If you go to the other side, compare it with the other side, the lung markings are normal and probably a little increased. Okay, I know this is a difficult slide, but this is a big pulmonary embolus. A pulmonary embolus obstructing the right pulmonary, the right pulmonary artery. Okay, the patient presented in acute, uh, in acute way. So what will happen when the embolus obstructs the right? Uh, the right will look oligemic. Oligemic means less blood, while more blood will be shifted to the other side. So the other side will look sometimes a plethoric or more more blood in it okay i know this is this is difficult and probably uh, you will say we cannot i mean this is difficult to diagnose pulmonary embolism pulmonary embolism is better diagnosed by uh, a ct of the chest you are right but by the time you get ct of the chest it may be too late okay if you see a, a patient say with a fracture a fracture of the femur or something. These these patients are prone for pulmonary emboli, or a, a woman giving giving uh, labor to to a baby on the obstetric side and suddenly presented just suddenly just like this with shortness of breath and uh, maybe associated with chest pain as well. Suspect pulmonary embolus. If you see this picture, immediately start anticoagulants. And then next next day, ask for CT scan and uh, uh, and think about it. If the diagnosis is wrong, you can you can stop your anticoagulants. Okay, but this is pulmonary embolism. Next slide, please. Yes, um, uh, this patient uh, uh, came with fever, and he was very ill looking patient. You can see that there is infiltrative lesions on both sides, but these infiltrative lesions are quite different from the infiltrative lesions I have uh, uh, shown you earlier. These are miliary. The nodules here are very fine nodules, very fine nodules on both lung fields compared to that one, gross nodules. So this is miliary tuberculosis. This is miliary tuberculosis. Can we see a lesion like this and it's not miliary tuber? Probably yes, okay? But here, um, 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 when you put the clinical picture with the x-ray, the patient is running fever, the patient is very ill, so this is miliary tuberculosis. I have seen a few cases. I usually put these patients on anti-TB treatment immediately 
And this is one indication to cover them with corticosteroid because the anti-TB treatment will need, will need uh, uh, probably five to seven days to start working. And if the patient is, is critically ill, he may die before the anti-TB starts the treatment. But the, the corticosteroid, although generally speaking, corticosteroids are contraindicated with tuberculosis, but it will give you time. You will buy time by giving corticosteroid covered with anti-TB treatment. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, this patient complains of cough, a blood stain for three weeks. He's 40 years old man, and he smokes 20 cigarettes per day for 30 days. You, you, if you look to the, uh, if you look to the, uh, uh, to the black, to the black arrow, the black arrow. Yes, there is there is a lesion here, and the lesion is infiltrative, and the white. The white arrow will show you uh, an accumulation of lymph nodes in the, hyla, in the hilum. This is typical of a bronchogenic carcinoma. Bronchogenic carcinoma in a heavy smoker, 48 years old man. Next slide, please. Well, thank you very much. We have to stop here. Actually, um, um, if you allow me, ladies and gentlemen, I'll stop here and uh, uh, we will continue X-ray of the heart uh, at some other time. What's the time now? Muhammad Samani? Should we go to the now? I'll go to the doctor. Okay, then... Uh, ايش قد الوقت عندكم الان؟ 10 ل 10 يعني تاخر الوقت ولا بعدكم؟ يعني هو زين دكتور اوكي اذا جيف مي 7 اور 8 minutes and I'll come back to you يلا خلينا نكمل اوكي ثانك يو كان هذا الكلام مفهوم محمد لحد الان؟ نعم دكتور حيل زين دكتور بس نعم اي وقف ال شو اسمه مفهوم الكلام كان دكتور بس الستيرويد قلنا بالتي بي اي اذا هو اكيوت يعني وسيفير اي اذا اكيوت او سيفير لوك جنرالي سبيكينج كورتيكوستيرويدز از كونترا انديكيتد وذ توبركلوزيس بس ذير ار فيو انديكيشنز ون اوف ذيم از ذيس And the second in, uh, indication, probably if there is a plural effusion as well, okay? But I usually, I don't give it with a plural effusion. I keep aspirating with the effusion and giving anti-TB treatment. But believe me, if you just give anti-TB treatment for a patient who is seriously ill, like the one uh, with the X-ray I have uh, shown to you, the patient may die before the anti-TB start, uh, start working. Okay. Okay, but I will say it again. Generally speaking, you shouldn't give corticosteroid um, for a patient with a tuberculosis. Okay. But this is an, ex an exception, and you cover it with anti-TB. Okay, a few minutes, and okay. I'll come back to you. Okay, take a look.
Muhammad, are you there? Muhammad? يلا محمد اذا سامحني خلينا نبدي اوكي دكتور بعدين هذا الكلام الزايد محمد من نبدي من فضلك يعني امسحه من تنزله على اليوتيوب خلي بس المحاضره ان شاء الله دكتور يلا اوكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ناو وي ويل جو تو بارت 2 اوف of uh, our talk and that's x-ray of the heart um, i just want you to familiarize yourself with the surface anatomy of the heart okay um, the left border of the heart is made by the left ventricle and the left ventricular wall is as usually thick compared to the right ventricular wall on the uh, on the right side of the heart Okay, and uh, on the right side of the heart, above is the superior vena cava, below is the inferior vena cava. Um, the right atrium uh, share the right border of, of the heart. So um, three chambers of the heart are shown on the chest x-ray. The right atrium, the right ventricle on the right side, and the left ventricle on the left side. The left atrium is posterior. The left atrium doesn't usually show uh, normally Uh, on the uh, PA view of the chest X-ray, but we can see it only when it enlarges. And I'll show you some examples. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, look to this and uh, familiarize yourself with the with the. You see the right atrium on the on the right uh, side. Yes. 
Yes, and and part of this is the right ventricle as well. On the left side is the left ventricle. On the left ventricle, very good. And when you go up, there is the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery. And below the pulmonary artery, just below the pulmonary artery, the left atrial appendage. This is a dip usually. This is important on reading the chest x-ray to pay attention to the left uh, atrial appendage. And above the pulmonary artery is the aortic knuckle. Yes, this is the aorta. So the, the left border of the heart, the aorta, the pulmonary artery, left atrial appendage, left ventricle. Next slide, please. Yes, very good. Um, this is, uh, 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 will show you uh, how inspiration and expiration can affect the heart. Um, the, the chest x-ray of the heart is a standardized, a standardized for deep inspiration, for deep inspiration. So what is the order a technician should give to the patient? Is the, the technician should teach the patient um, to breathe in and out of a few times so he collect oxygen and wash out CO2 and then to take a deep inspiration and hold his breathing in, in deep ins, uh, inspiration and then take a picture. Um, most of the, of the X-ray technician uh, will do mistakes here. Not most, but some of them. What they will do, they will say, if you go to the X-ray department, you will hear this. This is wrong. أقولها مرة ثانية المفروض يحل ما يأخذ النفس يعطي النفس بعدين اسحب النفس أوقف ويعلم للمريض how to hold his breath and then take a film okay you can see that the film on inspiration is the normal while the the one on the right hand side in expiration for the same patient the heart look bigger why the heart look bigger because normally Normally, the heart moves like this, okay? When the diaphragm goes down, and when this is inspiration, the heart will look smaller. In expiration, the heart will look bigger. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, um, left ventricular enlargement is usually... Uh, shown on the left border, as we said earlier, the left border of the heart is, ma is made by the left ventricle. Um, the left ventricle enlarged towards the diaphragm. Yes, do you see the, the arrow here? Exactly. This is pointing to where about the left ventricle will enlarge. The left ventricle enlarged towards the diaphragm. It overlaps the diaphragm. While the right ventricle, I show you another slide, the right ventricle is lifted up. It will show yeah, when it enlarged. We, we, we will see a slide of this. Next slide, please. <coughs> yes, this is right ventricular enlargement. Uh, the uh, uh, main pulmonary artery is a, is a prominent uh, uh, here, there is common common causes of uh, uh, of right ventricular enlargement. You know them: mitral valve stenosis, chronic pulmonary heart disease, pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary hypertension, phallotetralogy, ASD, VSD. I'll show you some examples of these. Okay, but right ventricular enlargement is usually better seen on a lateral X-ray of the heart. As you see the, here, this, the schedule, the lower one on the, on the left side of the film. In here. Yes, this one. Okay. He, the, the, your arrow now on the sternum. On the sternum. And to the left of it is the heart. Normally, one third of the sternum is occupied by the heart. Suppose that this is the sternum, this is the heart. One third of the sternum is occupied by the heart. When the, when the right ventricle enlarges, it enlarges in this way. So if you see 
that two thirds of the sternum is overlapped by the heart. This means that there is right ventricular enlargement. Next slide, please. Yes, um, this is uh, right ventricular enlargement. The red arrow points to the pulmonary artery, very prominent pulmonary artery. This means that the pulmonary pressure is high and when the pulmonary pressure is high, the right ventricle will enlarge. Okay, the right ventricle will enlarge. In the, uh, in, in the past, uh, we used to do barium swallow as well with lateral view, as you see in the other film. In the other film, yes, yes. This is a lateral film and there is a barium on the other side of the slide. Okay, you see the white line in here. This is, this is barium go a little to the right, more to the right, more to the right. Yes, yes. This is barium in the oesophagus. Okay. This is barium in the oesophagus. When the left atrium enlarge, it indent the barium in the oesophagus. Next slide, please. Yes. You see here, the, uh, the, 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 the barium is indented um, indented um, by an enlarged left atrium, which occurs, of course, with mitral stenosis. But now, now we can tell enlargement of of the left atrium by by looking to the PA view, the X-ray without barium, the other X-ray exactly here. Do you see the red the red line? Yes, the red line shows a double, what we call a double border of the heart. Yeah, this is exactly, the red is one border and then there is another border more to the, to the left, okay? This one, this indicates that the left atrium is enlarged, okay? The, the red arrow is the normal heart and the one behind this, the one behind this is the enlarged left atrium. This is number one. Number two, number two, the blue arrow on the other side, exactly this one, shows a full atrial appendage. Do you remember I told you that the atrial appendage is usually a dimple below the pulmonary artery? Here it is full, okay? And this is typical of mitral stenosis. Which is, uh, there is an old term which is called mitralization. The left heart border will look straight, okay? This is the pulmonary artery, your arrow now on the pulmonary artery. Yes, this is the pulmonary artery, and of course, the pulmonary artery is likely to be prominent because the pressure, the pressure will be high. Next slide, please. Yeah, this patient has history of rheumatic fever. This is very similar to the patient to presented in, uh, in our first meeting. Okay, you can see that uh, 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 the, the, B, the B is the pulmonary artery, a little prominent, and the A, the A arrow, the A is a prominent uh, uh, left atrial appendage. Okay, and this is characteristic of mitral valve disease. And is mitral valve disease common with rheumatic fever? Yes, very common. One of the commonest complications of rheumatic fever in the heart is uh, mitral valve disease. Whether mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, or mitral valve disease, which means both stenosis and uh, insufficiency. Next, please. Yes. This patient has history of uh, rheumatic fever. You can see the, uh, 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 the heart generally is enlarged, okay? And the enlargement is towards the diaphragm or away from the diaphragm. It's towards the diaphragm. So it's, it's left ventricular, yes. The left ventricle is enlarged. Does the left ventricle enlarge with mitral stenosis? The answer is no. In mitral stenosis, the left ventricle, if anything, is a protective, is a protected. Does it enlarge 
with mitral regurgitation? The answer is yes, is yes. So the main problem here is mitral regurgitation or mitral valve disease, which is both regurgitation and, and stenosis. You can see again that the left ventricular this is, the, this is the left ventricle, go up, go up to the left. Yes, this is the appendage, prominent left. And above it is the pulmonary artery. Go a little, this is the pulmonary artery. And this one is the aortic knuckle. The, the first, yes, this is the aortic knuckle. Very good, very good. You can see that the, uh, the right costophrenic angle the right costophrenic angle is obliterated. And in this patient, this patient has heart failure as well due to mitral valve disease and there is pleural effusion. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this patient presented with shortness of breath and syncopal attacks. Okay, what you can see here, you can see that the left ventricle is a prominent uh, yes, the left ventricle is, is a prominent, but not very much enlarged. But the ascending aorta where the red arrow is, is a prominent, is a prominent. The aorta is a prominent. This is typical, typical aortic stenosis, aortic stenosis. And why, why the aorta after the stenosis is a prominent because of turbulent flow. You know, if you remember your physics, fluid passes in vessels in two ways, either linear flow or turbulent flow, okay? If the aortic valve is normal, the flow is linear, smooth and linear. If the aortic valve is stenosed, there will be turbulence of, of the blood. And post this, after this turbulence, after it, the, uh, it will cause enlargement, enlargement of the of the artery. Of course, on examination, if you put your if you put your hand for palpation in the in the second intercostal space to the right, to the right, you may feel a thrill. And when you listen, you will hear a very harsh murmur, so character murmur of aortic stenosis. Next slide, please. Yeah, this patient presented with uh, shortness of a breath on exertion. Okay, go to the other slide, please. Okay, um, this is an important slide when you, you see the pulmonary artery here is a prominent, okay? Yes, this is the pulmonary artery, exactly, yes. It's a prominent, and it indicates, it indicates um, that the pressure in here is, is high, or actually, in this patient, it's not the pressure high. Again, because of turbulence. This is typical of pulmonary stenosis, PS, pulmonary stenosis. But how can you tell that it's pulmonary stenosis? Number one, the heart is not enlarged as it is in mitral valve disease, if you remember the previous slide, okay? The second point is that if you see the lung fields, the lung fields are oligemic, means less blood in it because of pulmonary stenosis, because the pulmonary artery will ultimately lead to the lungs, okay? So because of stenosis, less blood is, is going, less blood is going, and so the lungs are oligemic, while the lungs in mitral valve disease and in another uh, pathologies like ASD, I'll show you a slide, they are plethoric. So remember these two terms, please. Oligemia, plethora. Okay, this is pulmonary stenosis. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, uh, uh, this is, you see, again, the, prom the pulmonary artery here is a prominent, okay? Pulmonary artery is a prominent, but you can see that the lung fields is, is a plethoric, yes. On both sides, it's a plethoric. Contrary, 
to the previous slide. In the previous slide, it was oligemic. Yes, yes. So this is pulmonary stenosis. The other one is atrial septal defect. This is atrial septal defect. Do you see the difference? I think it's quite clear. Okay, but an atrial septal defect, you hear a white splitting of the second heart sound, a soft ejection, systolic murmur, the ECG shows partial right bundle branch block, the, the chest x-ray uh, will show a picture like this, okay, and uh, uh, okay, uh, how to uh, come the diagnosis in ASD? Imagine that you, you come from the superior, you put a catheter in the vein, and you come from, in, from the arm. If you go from the arm, yes, exactly, you will go into the superior vena cava. You take a sample of blood here in the superior vena cava, and you will see that the oxygen saturation is probably um, 70, okay? Then you push your catheter down, push your catheter down, go down, go down. Yes, this is the right atrium. Now you are in the right atrium. Go further down, Go further down, push the catheter further down, further down. This is the inferior vena cava. In the inferior vena cava, the situation may be 68. Above 70, down 68. In the middle, you take oxygen saturation, and take, uh, checking the oxygen saturation is very, very simple. When you do cardiac catheterization, there's a technician sitting beside you, and you give him a drop of blood, and he give you the result. If it is if above a 70 and below a 68, you expect the middle to be 69. But in ASD, you'll find that in the middle, uh, probably it's 86 or 90. Why? Because oxygenated blood is mixing with deoxygenated blood. Oxygenated blood is, shift, is shifted from the left side uh, through the ASD to the right atrium. So this is the way you diagnose atrial septal defect by cardiac catheterization. Next slide, please. This is slide is typical of tetralogy of fallow. You can see that the heart is enlarged, but the enlargement is mainly right ventricular. Why mainly right ventricular? Because the, the, heart board, the left heart border is away, lifted away, yes, yes lifted away from the diaphragm. No, go to the left side. Go to the left side, please. The heart border, yes, is lifted away. While if you remember, in left ventricular enlargement, the, the heart will overlap the ventricle. Here, it's lifted away from the, from, uh, the diaphragm. I beg your pardon. In, in left ventricular enlargement, the heart overlaps the diaphragm, but in right ventricular enlargement, the heart border is lifted away, as it is here, from the diaphragm. Next slide, please. Yes, this is a global heart, enlarged heart. Okay, the lung fields are uh, not a plethoric. This is very typical of pericardial effusion. Very typical typical of pericardial effusion, you see as if you are holding a sack and there is a fluid in it, water in it. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. This is an important slide. This is um, what you see in heart failure. Okay. Um, um, in heart failure, you can see curly A lines and curly A lines here the orange, the orange arrows, orange arrows. Yeah, they are veins coming out from coming out from the hilum, and they fade. Yeah, from the hilum, they come out from the hilum, and they fade away towards the periphery. They fade away towards the periphery, while curly B lines, which are the blue arrows curly B lines, they are lymphatics. They should touch the border of the heart, of the chest, you see? They touch the border and they fade away to the center, exactly the opposite of curly A line. These are diagnostic of heart failure, diagnostic of heart failure. Okay, you can see 
that this patient is in acute pulmonary edema, is critically ill, there's a catheter in. You see the catheter over the heart shadow. Next slide. Yes, yes, this one. Yes. Next slide, please. Um, this is typical alveolar edema, alveolar edema, okay? Sometimes described as uh, bat wing or butterfly farage, okay? You see very big wings and, okay, this, the, if, you, if you do um, casualty, it's very likely that you will get an old man with severe short of uh, shortness of breath, gasping for air, running tachycardia, his blood pressure may be very high, in acute pulmonary edema, you do ch a chest x-ray, and it is just like this, you give him antihypertensive treatment, say captopril or something like this, and intravenous diuretics, and uh, probably beta blocker, and the patient will improve it dramatically in most of the patients. Next slide, please. This is alveolar edema. Next slide, please. I think we have finished. Okay. Thank you very much. العفو <تصفيق> And we have a lower lobe. The lower lobe is lower and posterior. And then we have a middle lobe. The middle lobe overlaps the heart. Okay? So if there is a consolidation in the middle lobe, you won't be able to tell the border of the consolidation from the border of the heart. It will overlap the heart. And this is the silhouette sign. The lower lobe, it overlaps the diaphragm. So if there is infiltrative uh, pneumonia or consolidation, you won't be able to tell the lesion from the diaphragm. But you will be able to tell it from the heart border because the lower, the lower lobe is not in, in contact with the, with the heart border. Is this clear? Yes. Now, Dr. Wadha, thank you. أي لو ترجع أوكي أه أه أوكي any other question can you explain why the the ASD the lung become blistered حنين حنين اسمك حنين سؤالك إنه أنا أنا ASD Why the lung is plethoric? Yes, this is this is a good a good question. Hanin, um, normally the blood which goes which goes to the right heart comes from the superior vena cava, which drains the upper part of the body, and from the inferior vena cava, which drains the lower part of the body plus the gastrointestinal tract, okay? Both of these, the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava will go to the right atrium. In ASD, in ASD, there is an additional blood coming from the left side because in ASD, atrial septal defect, there is a hole between the left atrium and the right atrium. The pressure in the left atrium is higher than the pressure in the right atrium. So blood will be shunted from left to right. So the blood in the right atrium will be the normal blood coming from the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, plus the blood which is shunted from, le from the left atrium to the right atrium. That's why, and all this will pass to the right ventricle, 
and from the right ventricle will go into the right and left pulmonary artery and the lungs. That's why the lung will look plethoric, i.e. contains more blood. Is this clear? It's clear. Thank you, doctor. Any other question? Uh, 